The power is in the people. Why else do you think tyrants throughout history try to corrupt your mindset and your education? First, a few principles must be analyzed. Sovereignty, authority, and power. Once these are properly defined, I see no way one can come logically to any other conclusion. First, sovereignty. What is it? The No Webster 1828 Dictionary defines in part sovereignty as the supreme power or supreme authority. There are two angles to this word sovereignty that must be analyzed for a complete understanding of the term. The first is between the creator and the created. The second is between peers or between sovereign individuals. Although not absolutely necessary for an understanding of rights and duties, it is good to understand that the founders approached rights from a creator perspective. In other words, they saw rights as being endowed from God, as being from God himself. And thus, it states in the Noah Webster Dictionary, the absolute sovereignty belongs only to God. The relationship was between the Creator and us, the created. That God was the sovereign in relation to us. So that is from an eternal perspective. But what about right now between individual persons and society in a legal context? You see, society doesn't exist outside of its individual members. A forest does not exist outside of, its, of the individual trees that make it up. Once you realize that the public is not something tangible you can touch, that it is made up of individual persons, it is then incumbent upon you to realize the rights and duties of those individuals. Thus, the statement that man is sovereign is true in this context. That I am a sovereign entity just as you are a sovereign entity. And that when we say something like the city of Orem, or the state of Utah, or even the United States of America, that its sovereignty is dependent upon the individual members that make it up. That instead of listing 90,000 citizens' names, we just say the city of Orem. But it has no sovereign power outside of the authority vested in it by the individual members of society. Now, combining the two aspects of sovereignty, it is key to realize that the government did not create you. You are a creator of the government. Now, there needs to be an understanding of the difference between power and authority. You see, power comes from below. Authority is top-down, but there's a lot of confusion even in the constitution-minded community of where the source of that authority is. Often they depict it as a pyramid with the leader on top, the people on bottom. But with this in mind, the source of authority and the source of power are both the people. Therefore, the people are on top, the people are on bottom, the power from below, the authority from the top, and the public servants are in between. Now power is merely the ability to act. That may be because someone is merely the biggest, or the strongest, or has the biggest guns, or even has the biggest gang of people. 
But that action is not dependent on any moral authority. Authority is the right to act or a just claim to act. It is action that is in harmony with the unalienable rights and duties inherent in man. For example, let's suppose that we as a society hire a sheriff. Now, of course, this would be completely legitimate because every individual in that society has the right to self-defense. So we can extend that right or exercise that right in the hiring of someone to help us defend ourselves. Now, we have elected this guy. We have vested some of our authority in this sheriff. But let's say he's a single person out on the street and there are 50 people in a mob that are coming to ransack our town. Who has the power? And who has the authority? You see, the mob, due to its numbers, and let's say even they had bigger guns, had the power, but they could not have the authority because I don't have any authority to ransack, pillage, plunder, rob, murder. Therefore, I could never vest that authority in any one person, let alone 50. Even if that was the majority of the people, authority must be in harmony with natural law. It must be in harmony with the rights and the associated duties that are inherent in man. Now let's suppose even further. We have our one sheriff with the authority. We have the mob of 50 ransacking the town. It is now incumbent upon the people where the power actually lies to stand up with their authority in harmony with the authority vested in that sheriff to defeat the mob. Let's say, for example, the city of Orem. 90,000 people against a gang of 50. Now, who has the power and yet retains the authority? Now, let's turn this example on its head. Let's suppose the sheriff is the leader of this mob of 50. And instead of openly and honestly ransacking the town, they pervert the police power that is there to protect the rights and enforce the duties of individual citizens and instead are using that police power to violate those very rights and to enforce supposed duties that do not exist at all. So what do the people ultimately do in this situation? Well, once again, you have a sheriff and 50 people in a mob and 90,000 citizens. Who has the power? Assuming a governmental system that allows for removal, frequent elections, impeachment, or any other check on the government from the people themselves, it is interesting to note what the founders did in response to a tyrannical government represented in a king and a parliament 3,000 miles away. Notice that they had the right to do what they did, the authority to do what they did, and finally they gathered enough power to make it so. See, government does not have power or privilege in and of itself. It is always derived from the people. And therefore, it is interesting to know that the people do not and cannot give power to a government. They vest authority. For me to give power would assume that I am divesting myself of power. And that's impossible to do. But I say, here. Here's some of my authority with my name on it under these conditions. And of course, that can only remain authority so long as it's in harmony with the rights that are mine and their corresponding duties.
And this is why tyrants and dictators and oligarchies all throughout history have had an interest in corrupting the knowledge of the people. To somehow use divine authority or divine right to rule or even to pretend that they are God or to use a national church that they claim to be the head of to bind the constituent people that they actually should be representing. You see, if you can convince people that you're the sovereign and that their rights come from you, there's nothing in your way and there's no logical line of the sand that says you cannot do anything that you want. It doesn't matter if someone thinks the sky is pink, it is blue. It doesn't matter if someone's been convinced that they're a subject and some tyrant is the sovereign. They are a sovereign individual endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. With this in mind, it doesn't matter how tyrannical the government becomes. At any point, the sovereign individuals that make up that society can take back that authority and can reclaim the rights that are already theirs. Who has the power? What about America? What about these United States of America? You have how many hundreds of millions of people and 535 voting members of Congress, a president, and nine Supreme Court justices. Let me ask you again, who has the power? Because ultimately, it is entirely up to us.